But like, uh, <laughs> but that, those those parts, like those data, are very easy to distinguish. Like if the, like say that our fraction bandwidth is around two to one point five, and sometimes it creates some data like negative point four. So it's kind of easy to just use some simple statistics to uh, to just swipe out this data. Rivals of Boston Dynamics. We're going to introduce you today to our regolith collector robot design. So here's an overview of our mechanism. So our goal is to drive over the uneven terrain of the regolith and the ground and to scoop up as much regolith as possible using multiple trips. So we had three subsystems of our design including the rake, the bucket lifter, and the chassis modifications. So um, our basic strategy was using the bucket to collect the regolith. The bucket can lift up and down and tilts back and forth, and the rake pushes the regolith out of the bucket. And for the chassis modifications, um, we replaced the original tires with six inch pneumatic tires to drive over the regolith better. Uh, so our hardware design mainly concerned the bucket manipulation, so we designed a two degree freedom system for the lifting and tilt. Uh, we have a lead screw system uh, for the lifting, just mainly because it's not back drive above, so we can uh, uh, hold the position passively, and we also have a tilting mechanism, a uh, hinge on the bottom of the uh, structure there that's uh, tilted by a winch system that you'll see on the robot. Um, and yeah, we also uh, had a rake system uh, that we do have something similar on the robot right now. Uh, through our iterative tests, we actually found that uh, with our larger wheels, we were able to collect the most regolith uh, by just driving forcefully into the piles. Um, so we chose to go with the most uh, effective design, even though we did uh, build and test the rake system. For our control system, we explored three different ways to locate and to navigate our robot. Um, first when using the April tags, the April tags were pretty great at telling us where we were, but they were uh, not exactly robust. If we lost sight of them, they would be quite difficult. We couldn't see them from the far starting corner. Um, we also looked at using the wheel encoders and just dead reckoning. Also, this is difficult as some of the other teams have pointed out. When you're stuck on regolith and your wheels are spinning, um, that's going to completely throw off your, your encoders and your dead reckoning. Um, and then we also explored teleoperated via a joystick or a controller. Um, so the April tags, we got it to work somewhat, but had difficulty changing our tra trajectories as well as maintaining a constant signal on that April tag. Um, and so we've decided that for today we're going to use teleoperations using the 10 hertz um, controller. We're using an Xbox controller today to make it easy. 
Um, but we also started building or designing our architecture as if we were going to implement a, a full system. Uh, and we decided that we would do that with a discrete PD controller um, to have state control of our robot, as well as an extended Kalman filter to take the April tag location as well as the wheel encoder data and to optimize our route and our position um, for uh, autonomous control. All right, um, I'm here to introduce our gripper mechanism for the UR5. So the basic overview of our mechanism was a um, four bar linkage on either side that uses, uh, that contracts fingers in, into the holes uh, aligned on the brick to grab it. And then we have four sensors on either side that uh, serve to align the block with the finger mechanism uh, as well as indicate when it should activate to grab it and uh, let go. And we do that using two different force thresholds. And then, yeah, the fingers are actuated just by a single servo set up uh, in the middle of the end effector. Um, so this is a quick breakdown of the two main sub-assemblies within the end effector. Like I said, the cones are attached using a compliant, um, it's a membrane and it allows the cones to shift uh, laterally and vertically um, to make sure that the, cone, or that the brick is aligned when we're placing it and picking it up. And then the gripper fingers, which like I said, are actuated by that um, servo in the center of the end effector uh, through the linkage to grasp the brick. And then our computer vision algorithm, um, is done by, you know, with the goal of detecting centers of the bricks uh, individually and then getting the locations of those bricks within the world coordinates relative to the robot. So you do this by uh, applying a series of computer visions operations. So first you mask by depth to get each level of the brick and then by HSV values. Um, seems like I'm short on time so I'll hustle through this. Uh, Basically, you detect uh, all the house circles within the brick that you uh, have located um, and use that to find the center and compute the tilt. Um, and then a similar algorithm is used uh, on the base and when you're placing it. But unfortunately, we're not able to integrate the April tag detection um, with the locations detected by the camera and pixel uh, in the pixel frame. And so we'll be uh, using um, manual control for our uh, UR5. Thank you. Wheels really give us some extra speed, which we utilize to, to be, be a speed demon out there. Uh, right now we're resetting our bucket so that it's uh, on the ground and able to scoop up the regolith, as well as resetting the rake. Our overall scooping uh, strategy is we first drive into the pile, uh, then raise the bucket a little bit, 
and then drive in one more time to try to really pack that regolith in on top of each other, uh, which allows us to get a really large and really full bucket uh, to maximize what we're getting per scoop. Then we uh, raise our bucket up while we're driving, uh, minimizing the amount of time that we have to wait, drive over to our bucket, and then we uh, use our winch mechanism, the weight of the bucket tilts it down, uh, dumps it out, and then the rake itself pushes the regolith out at the same time. And as Roberto mentioned, we learned about slam techniques in uh, lecture, so we've decided to implement some to really get all of that regolith out of that bucket. And we're just going to repeat this process um, as many times as we have time for and try to uh, get a bunch of the regolith in there and, and maybe set a new class record. Uh, but I'm going to pass it off to the robot, the UR5 team now to talk about what's going on. Yeah, so we have a we have two force sensors that are supposed to detect when we're pushing down onto a brick. Um, so and we're using manual control right now. So the problem that we're encountering, we did not power our servo before we started doing it, so the gripper lowered into place. And then it tried to sig the Arduino tried to signal to close the gripper, and the gripper did not close. So now the gripper is stuck in the brick. We're trying to get it out, and then we'll go for the green brick on the side over there. Yeah, so the brick that we were going for actually partially started connecting to the brick below it, which meant that it started tilting down at an angle. And then when we used our end effector to align this back and forth, one side of the four sensors went deeper into uh, that side of the brick. And the way that we actually decide or use the four sensors to decide to close the grouping mechanism is when both four sensors are above a certain threshold. And so, obviously, one of them went above a certain threshold, but because the brick was tilted, the left one didn't go above the threshold, and so we continued moving down, and it got the right one stuck. Uh, yeah, I can say that this is not a problem that we encountered when we were testing, because I think it's a little bit of an edge case, but definitely um, something to watch out for.
Yeah, so uh, this is a better example of how it's supposed to work. Um, so the cones were used to align the brick with the uh, gripping mechanism. Um, it seems like the gripping mechanism didn't completely work properly, but it's uh, still got a hold of it. Um, so now Diane is maneuvering the UR5 back over the base in order to place the block. We have a couple different resolutions of movement um, in order to allow us to kind of go localize the bricks in a more efficient way. Uh, for example, move in like the positive y direction, half a meter, so you don't have to do a bunch of smaller clicks, and then go to a smaller uh, resolution in order to uh, better align with the, the holes in the brick. Yeah, so right now we're just doing a couple of fine adjustments to make sure that it uh, slides onto the lower brick smoothly. All right, looks like it's going on. All right, there you go, first break placed. Seems like we're having a few power supply issues with our Arduino and our servo. So we, we've got some extra time, so we wanted to demonstrate another functionality of the way that we've designed our robot. Uh, with the bucket able to go all the way down to the ground, um, we're able to lower it all the way, and ideally we're able to bulldoze some of this uh, quarter inch of regolith over in the corner. So since we have some time, we're gonna, we're gonna try to demonstrate that. So not as effective as the large piles, uh, however, since we are able to, with our design, lower our bucket all the way flush to the ground, we can scrape up um, the thin layer of regolith that they've provided over um, by the collection point.
Since the regolith is quite small, uh, and since in order to have it be able to move smoothly, we needed there to be a slight gap between the two pieces of aluminum. Uh, so the tape gives us some compliance there and acts as like a, um, a flexible membrane so that we can um, scrape out all of the regolith in the bucket and not have to leave any that could get caught in a gap um, between the two pieces of aluminum sliding. What's, oh geez, that's why I what is the maximum volume of regolith that you can carry in one load? Yeah, so uh, of the trials that we've done, our maximum volume was 1.3 kilograms of regolith uh, in one scoop. Uh, obviously this re requires ideal conditions starting with a full pile. Um, we did notice that the amount that we scoop up decreases as the height of the pile goes down. Um, so our current scoops are getting smaller than they were to start, but our max capacity is about 1.3. So, just eyeballing it, but it looks like you guys might be collecting a radically larger quantity of regolith than other teams. Any particular design choices, so far, I'm saying so far, any particular design choices you think help with that? So, uh, the, I guess a couple of the main design choices uh, that helped us were one, decoupling the motion of the lifting and tilting of the bucket uh, because it allows us to get the optimal uh, scooping position and dumping position. Um, we also have the larger wheels which gives us a lot more driving torque. Um, so when we run into the piles we can uh, grasp a significantly larger amount of regolith than we could have as opposed to if we had the original wheels that we were given. Um, so those were uh, very helpful. Hey, Cambridge, you know, um, I don't see any autonomy in there. You know, Roberto is enjoying the uh, joystick, uh, playing with it. Um, what sort of autonomy do you have in here? So currently... Do you uh, give up all the, the visual systems and then, uh, you know, every time you're reading, you give, give up? Uh, the camera is just a decoration, so what's that? So uh, we did experiment with April Tag Navigation uh, and we got some basic functionality out of it of it locating the tags and driving to a location. Um, it wasn't robust though. We, are, we weren't seeing repeatable results uh, and so uh, we, we didn't feel like it would be give us our best shot of achieving our objective of uh, collecting the regolith to build a uh, people habitat on the moon. So we wanted to go with a more reliable system that we had proven could work. Okay, yeah, thank you guys. Uh, we need to go into the Q&A session, so, and then we will start dismantling. I'd like to ask the next team to come up. So, you know, you get the trouble with the, you know, camera um, and the robot integrations, but I suppose after you identify the locations by the camera, and then knowing the uh, coordinates, so you can just uh, send the that numbers to the robot, and then the robot is supposed to uh, move that point. Unpredictable situation that happened. 
So, can you explain a little bit about uh, how you get to occur and uh, you want to get out of it? Yeah, so I definitely think uh, a relatively simple way to get out of a stuck brick location would be to have um, another uh, another smaller mechanism um, that could maybe provide some force downwards on it if it gets stuck uh, in a situation like that um, without human interference. And I think that would be something that you can implement with uh, you know, probably just one more actuator. Um, two more pieces, um, but uh, yeah, and besides that, I think uh, potentially creating a cone that might be able to react to something like that and uh, maybe contract or uh, sort of store itself from that position uh, with another command. And then uh, another question about the gripper. So if I'm not mistaken, the compliance is between the cone and then the frame around that's surrounding the linkages. And so that frame and the linkages are both more or less rigidly connected to the wrist of the R5. So with the current kind of configuration of compliance, it seems to me that the uh, Cones are mostly a visual aid for alignment, correct? Uh, so it seems like the cones are mostly a visual aid for alignment. Um, well, besides just visually, um, I, it's, I think it was tough to see, but as it goes down, um, the fingers kind of get aligned pretty precisely with the side of the inside wall of that inner hole. And that's partly due to the cones actually kind of pushing the block um, in small directions towards towards that to make sure that it doesn't interfere with any of like the smaller ridges that are on uh, the inside of the block. I see. So then, how do you balance the compliance of the finger or the compliance of the membrane connecting the cones with the forces that you want to apply to the block to center it? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, like, uh, we didn't experiment with changing the membrane or changing the stiffness of the membrane, but we experimented with just changing the length of this, like, offset here. And the longer that offset, the more compliant this is. So we shortened the offset until the brick would move, and we'd get alignment. So we originally had those cones fixed directly to the, the frame, and then we wanted to add compliance, so we introduced the membrane. And then we also had the, the offset and we introduce less and less offset until we know where we want it to be. Thank you. Great, yeah. All right, so we need to break. Um, so first one is for design. The bottom, great. Ready?